so uh, i would uh, i would uh, make eight of seven chapters but i won't go into detail but uh, rather i would uh, i would com- uh, i would take the book into three parts the first part would be the background the other uh, second part would be the concept- conceptualization of soft power and public diplomacy uh, how china sees it and third is the application of the soft power and public diplomacy resources into uh, into application so uh, starting from the background uh, normally uh, generally we talk about the sino us relations in a geo strategic perspective geo economic perspective geo economic perspectives and uh, the majority of the literature available on the relations bilateral relations is based on some very uh, very strict strategic competition that is going on and the ensuing result and the ensuing uh, outcome would be a a great war uh, uh battle or a, a great power war uh, that is uh, something uh, we are forecasting in the coming future and that is a perspective that is based on a zero sum proposition my understanding uh, and i have taken the lead from uh, even some of the western theorists and sinologists who believe that Uh, this relationship is not a zero sum relation but rather a power uh, a positive sum relation and the war is avoidable so rather than looking at this relationship from a competitive point of view we also can see it in a view of cooptation that is the mix of cooperation and uh, competition so i have taken this particular view but the problem with the china us relations is that uh, there is a very strong war of narratives uh, which is going on and like uh, joseph nai himself said that uh, he would win whose story would win so uh, like this is the this is the war of narratives and the war of the stories that we are actually uh, witnessing uh, in the present day time so if you see that uh, the china is rising china acknowledges Uh, this by itself and uh, then there are countries across the world who are uh, projecting the rise of china but uh, i would like to refer it to the western discourse particularly emanating in the united states of america so back in 1990s the academic discourse on the rise of china uh, came uh, to the front and this discourse was based on the analysis that soviet union has come to an end uh, the communism is demising Uh, across the world and china is the next power that the us had to face but this discourse was primarily limited to the academia uh, the us political leadership did not uh, bought did not carry the same uh, same uh, projection towards china so uh, those in the chinese uh, leadership among the chinese leadership and the chinese academia they started listing what the us was saying back in 1995 94 uh, and they were saying that china is rising state and the rise of china would not be peaceful rise and the realist uh, discourse is based on this premise that china is a rising power that is also a revisionist power because its economic muscle would translate into a military power and that would create troubles for the for the usa and the chinese academia while listening Uh, came up with their own notion of the rise of china and that was the peaceful rise of china so you know in in the in the chinese uh, uh, discourse political discourse it is important to note that that it has to come from uh, both the academia and the political elite in 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 uh, in uh, hand in hand so that it could be commonly accepted so uh, by 2002 Uh, at bao forum uh, it was announced that the the notion of rise of, associated with the rise of china is the peaceful rise of china but you know chinese are very discreet when it comes to they are very careful in terms of their external communication and they were also uh, wary of the fact that the peaceful uh, has the term rise associated with that so rather than continuing with that the rise of china they eliminated the term rise and in 2005 another uh, another uh, terminology was was invented in china that was 
uh, termed as the peaceful development of China. So the rise, the term rise was totally eliminated from the discourse. So the peaceful development of China from that time, 2004, 2005, since now has been the primary focus of the Chinese external communication. It has been, uh, it has been read, it has been uh, written, it has been spoken uh, vividly by the Chinese political and academic elite. <clears throat> now, uh, it is easy to accept than to say, uh, because in the West, uh, even if the China is saying again and again that its rise is a peaceful rise or it's a peaceful development uh, course, uh, it, it would be very hard for the Western to buy this uh, this idea. So uh, here comes the, the second part of this book that is based on the uh, idea of soft power and public diplomacy. So, you know, uh, as you have yourself said that Joseph Nye came up with this idea of soft power, it, it is not a new concept. It has been there in the, um, in the uh, American political discourse since 1950s when Peter Bratz and Peter Bachaj wrote about the two-dimensional view of power in their book. So uh, we, we can say that Joseph Nye modernized or made this term more marketable. So uh, the soft power has three uh, primary features associated with that. Uh, first, it is the culture of a state that produces the soft power. <clears throat> the second is the institutions. And third are the foreign policy. <clears throat> Let me uh, also emphasize the fact that no power is naive. We cannot say that if it's soft power, it is something that is benign and it would not. Every power is aimed at getting something done uh, from the from your adversary or from the other party. So uh, the Chinese have taken a part of the American discourse of soft power. They have they have like chinese have this habit of internalizing the externalities you know you have heard this term like uh, this uh, so socialism with chinese characteristics marxism with chinese characteristics capitalism with chinese characteristics and so forth so what chinese have done is that chinese have uh, internalized the soft power by by saying that it's soft power with chinese characteristics and like the softer uh, connotation of Chinese culture has a very strong historical underpinning, like uh, the, the Confucius ideology and the Taoism, known also as Taoism, uh, have this very uh, strong sense of mildness, calmness, and, uh, and a, 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 I would say softness in the external relations. So it's not something that is new to the 5,000 years of civilization that Chinese have this uh, cultural soft power deeply embedded in their historical teachings and uh, practices. <clears throat> the, the, the second thing is that uh, when we talk about the public diplomacy, like if the soft power is the, is the source, you have to apply, like culture itself would not resonate to uh, something that can affect you. You have to produce an effect from a source. So here comes the public diplomacy. I have uh, two practitioners sitting with me, and it's very hard to uh, come across, uh, uh, come about a very, uh, I would say, uh, I can emphasize that how the public diplomacy work or not. They, they know way better than me. But like public diplomacy is the instrument of soft power. It is through which the soft power sources can be applied and then the results can be uh, taken. So public diplomacy is an aberration from the traditional diplomacy. The tra traditional diplomacy was more aimed at government to government relations. So the governments were uh, like they were communicating with each other. There was reporting and then there was co correspondence back, back and forth. But the public diplomacy is government's engagement with the public of a foreign country and even the institutions, non-state actors. And this is the way through which the governments create a positive perception and image of one's country into the minds of the other people. And that perception is translated into an image uh, through which the publics influence their own governments. 
so it's it's all it's all about the communication process and image building and perceptions through which the publics can influence their governments so china has through successive uh consultations and deliberations have incorporated the uh, the public diplomacy and the cultural soft power as the cornerstone of their external relations in the 17th 18th and 19th congress of the communist party of china these two features have been incorporated in the chinese uh, constitution and you know uh, in china when you have uh, institution institutionalized or internalized something in your constitution china gives it a give it prime importance and then they exercise it through full uh, full vigor so and despite of the fact that the international discourse on china talks about the rise of china and uh, china has been violating human rights or there is a, a bad uh, global image of china as perceived by the west china have been very determined to export such soft image and uh, soft through soft power resources and public diplomacy so uh, i won't go, go into much of the theoretical debate about how the realism thinks about china rise of china or constructivism which i have talked in great deal about uh, about the uh, in in the book but uh, what i would like to mention here is that you know uh, from 1972 the, the reproach of with uh, reproachment with china that happened in 1972 uh and the split between the soviets and the uh, and the chinese the american foreign policy towards china had been more aimed towards engaging with china with this view that perhaps china would sometime uh reinvent itself and china would become part of the global democratic order china had already uh, parted way with the communism Uh, in the economic sense of terms but politically china remained intact with the uh, with the communism so this was something that the american had in view that by engaging china they can bring in china as a democratic uh, state more open more liberal state so the successive governments had a more engaging policy with china but then donald trump came president donald trump in 2017 and uh, there was a new framework to deal with china that was aimed at uh, or declaring china as a national security concern uh china has been engaging with the usa for all these years and china's clout has been increasing in terms of investment uh, uh, the trade and engagement on all the facets of the foreign policy and uh, bilateral engagement so china has actually uh, focused more on engaging with china through its public diplomacy initiatives and for this purpose i have taken the three strands of public diplomacy the first strand is the mediated or strategic mediated diplomacy so mediation is normally taken as a conflict resolution mechanism uh, as we as we understand it in the in, in the sense of diplomacy but here the mediation is a process through which a media subsidiary is employed to influence the public perception of actor a in a state b so it's a, it's a mediated process through which a media subsidiary or media mediated subsidiaries are used to change the perception so we are living in a time of uh, of mass media of global media outreach so what china has done over the period of time that it has invested as many other countries al jazeera Qatar, CNN, Nuances of America, BBC, uh, Great Britain, they have engaged their state media and they have even supported the private media to build these countries' image among the foreign nations. So the China that, uh, that has through uh, CCTV now rebranded at, as CGTN, uh, Xinhua News and, uh, and many other uh, subsidiaries, they have engage the american public so i have given the numbers that the millions of americans are actually sub subscribed to the chinese uh, news channels if they are not uh, like uh, if they are not uh, uh, looking at them on televisions they are looking them through different apps through through their uh, laptops through their mobile phones and 
uh, America, the Americans have millions of subscription of Xinhua and CGTN, which are the Native Americans. I'm not talking about the Chinese diaspora that is living in the United States of America, which has uh, which has a huge number itself. Uh, similarly, the Chinese social media applications due to diaspora are commonly used not by the uh, not only by the uh, diaspora or the uh, immigrant Chinese, but also by hundreds and thousands of the Americans, which are uh, which are in a business transaction with the Chinese. So uh, apart from that, you know, the TikTok and other uh, social media applications have a have a huge outreach in the United States of America. Like uh, for average American, they use 45 minutes of the TikTok. That that is a huge time and According to Chinese, uh, according to sorry, an estimate, the American used around 11 to 13 hours of uh, their laptops and mobile phones. So this was the medium through which it is most effective to reach to the American audience immediately. Now, this is something which has a short term impact. You know, uh, we were talking uh, a few days back that the 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 media pulse has a very short span like you a, a, a news would impact you for six seven eight hours probably 12 hours but then it would vanish so what is the medium term strategy to engage with the american audience so there comes the branding of a country so this uh, the branding thing the nation branding uh, is a marketing tool to brand your product so in the contemporary times we can associate the states or nations with the brands and you know before you reach somewhere your image your perception through your branding reaches to, to an external actor or a foreign public. countries are known to be branded in a certain manner and we have very uh, very uh, i would say uh, parochial view of the countries based on uh, the images that have been constructed over a period of time so Chinese, what they have done is that they have branded themselves through advertisement in the United States of America, through uh, through so many ways. Like uh, like the Chinese before the visits of their presidents, historically they have been advertising uh, the China in a very uh, in a very positive manner. Uh, similarly, uh, Chinese have been uh, Chinese have been establishing the diaspora diplomacy. Through their diaspora, they have been engaging with the American audience, their cuisine, their culture, all these things. Like the panda diplomacy, for instance, the pandas have been sent uh, to the to the Americans. And you know, it's very interesting. Like whenever they have a stress in their relation, they even call back their pandas. So panda is not given to the Americans, but it's like temporary arrangement through which they can uh, they can uh, bring back their pandas. And uh, they have been uh, they have been sending their uh, terracotta uh, uh, warriors like from Xi'an city to the to the U.S. on a two two years visit. So th these are the like giving a more benign image. But China is not always about the uh, the violation of the human rights. China has China is a very vast and very diverse country with uh, like there are forty eight thousand. Chinese restaurants in the in the United States of America. The Chinatown is in every major U.S. city. So we have like by branding China by taking another world view of China. China very effectively engaged the American public. So the third part of this uh, part of this public diplomacy was the cultural diplomacy. You know, cultural is the uh, I would say the bedrock of the Chinese uh, public diplomacy and soft power based initiatives and. The Confucius institution, though the Americans have banned many of the Confucius institutions in the USA, uh, declaring them as a agent of foreign country or the veritable arm of the Communist Party, but still the Chinese cultural institutions and Confucius and language training programs are still part of the the American academia, and they are like 10, 12 working still there in the USA. The number may vary. Uh, similarly, the language training programs, the cultural exchanges, like there, there, uh, uh, there were like twelve thousand American students studying in the Chinese universities lately. So, so this is the impact of like we we are talking about the push factors, but there are the pull factors. 
the american foreign direct investment in china the american economy cannot run without china we are living in a very complex global environment like if you are talking about a competition yes there are competition but since the americans had imposed certain sanctions during the time of uh, donald trump president donald trump the trade bilateral trade has actually increased between the two countries uh, surpassing 760 perhaps billion us dollars uh, by this date so the impact of the cultural uh, public diplomacy is also there and the american through cuisine through diaspora through uh, language training through cultural institutions are very well engaged in the uh, with the chinese and the Ch china and the chinese people now lastly i would i would like to submit is yes the we can still say that if you if you go through the public surveys and data you will find that the acceptability of the chinese uh, people and products is relatively low despite of the fact that the americans are using the chinese products made in china and everything but the public perception is often a by product of the uh, of the uh, geopolitical rivalries and geo strategic rivalries and how the media is projecting a particular country that primarily affects the perception of the public in that country you know in uh, after the 2008 financial crisis where china was bailing out the us and many other countries across the world the chinese public perception was very good in in the united states of america before the donald trump and the covid hit the public perception was all time high around 30% in the uh, in the us usa so uh, like it is always subject to uh, the externalities how the uh, geo economic or geopolitical considerations would affect the public perception and how media is being projecting but we also have to understand for china china is new in this uh, game of perceptions and image building they are still learning the soft power is a western concept the public diplomacy is western concept and chinese have been, we have seen that how they have been uh, narrating the rise of china from peaceful rise to uh, this uh, peaceful development discourse and similar goes with the tools of public diplomacy and soft power so china is in a learning phase but how much they are investing in soft power and how much they are in investing in their public diplomacy initiative it is uh, only a second to the united states of america so uh, we can project that over the period of time the the initiatives would engage more and more and more american public through which the china can change uh, their uh, its perception so one uh, fact that i would like to share here is that majority of the americans who are using the chinese based video games and applications and everything they are between the age of 14 and 24 these are the people who china is primarily investing on in terms of the image improvement and engaging engagement so uh, when these people would be at the age certain age that would be like 25 30 35 so uh, china is perhaps investing in 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 those uh, segment of the population uh, through which they can change uh, their perception about themselves uh, among the american public 